All right, well, good morning, everyone. And welcome to everyone online. Hello, everyone online. So it's great to have all of you guys. Hey, um, I want to mention a couple things before I get going. One, sometimes when we have that one of the, that second song that uh, Hannah did, what a great, what a great job uh, the, the band did and all that stuff, yeah? So it's a confession. Sometimes I just, you know, I just like, you know what, I'm just going to leave and it's going to be, we're just going to end right there and just call it good. You ever feel that way? All right, good. See you guys. I got to go. <laughs> so it's like I worked all week for that. So anyway, hey, um, also too, let, let me uh, want to say that um, some of you guys would have gotten an email, hopefully if you're on our email. Um, we wanted to see what God is doing. It's been in our, kind of in our works for a long time. And I just haven't really kind of, you know, pulled the trigger to say, hey, let's do it. And then through the series, several people come up to me after the service is over or even emailed me just how God is working in their life in this series. And I thought, you know what, we need to probably go back to what I initially had said a while ago to our staff guys and like, hey, it'd be cool if we could film people just to kind of share on your own phone. You don't need to come in and do anything. Just on your phone, you know, what God's doing. Just shortly, you know, something around like 87 minutes or less, you know, something like that. Um, you know, just a couple minutes, just what God's doing. Um, I think it's an encouragement, especially in our time that we're in now where, you know, we don't see a lot of, uh, of folks, uh, you know, because for various reasons. And even when we see them in the store, we only see half of their face anyway. And so I think it'd just be good to see familiar faces hear stories of what God's doing, to let us know, even in this crazy time, God is active and alive. You believe that? Yeah. So some of you don't believe that. By the end of the message today, you will believe it, or you're not going to leave. That's just the way it's going to be. We're going to lock the door. So, All right. So you have an outline. Follow along. If you're online, you can download the app, and you can follow along today. Um, as we look at today, it's a two-part series, so we're not going to fill in all the blanks. So those of you who have to fill in every blank, deep breath. It's going to be okay. Next week, we'll fill in the rest of the blanks, all right? But we're going to talk about healing and restoration. And I was walking um, the other day. I was just doing a loop around my, my block. It's about two miles or something like that. And I was just kind of cruising around, just kind of thinking through the message and stuff. And I thought, you know, <clears throat> whether you look at the landscape of Oakley where I live or wherever you live or you look at California, you look at the United States, you know, you can look all over the place. There needs to be healing and restoration done. Would you, would you agree with that, Right. It definitely needs to be done. And, and in this politically charged environment that we're in, and, and I, I love politics, you know, it's kind of, I have a heart for that, but at the same time, I'm called to make disciples. And so in the debate of people with people about politics, you know, if we had more of these folks than less of those folks, then everything would be right, fine and all this other stuff. So, so hear me out. Until we have a revival in the land... It does not matter if we have more of these and less of those or less of those and more of these, right? Because it's only a transformed heart that is going to change the climate in, in which we're in, right? Whether you agree with it or disagree with it, it doesn't matter. It's only a heart. It's the same thing if you want to break it down to the individual level. The only thing that saves and fixes a broken marriage is Jesus. The only thing that frees a person from bondage is Jesus. The only thing that sets people free from corrupt thoughts and behavior is Jesus, right? So we need, right, and there's a, there's a promise in Scripture, we need a revival in the land of whatever that's going to look like in our, in, our, in our hearts, right? And it starts in the life of the believer, right? It starts in the life of you and I individually. Because if we're going to change the school district, we got to change our heart. If we're going to change the city council, we got to change our heart. If we're going to change the county supervisors, we got to change our heart. The state, the federal level, it all starts with us, all right? So now I'm going to start preaching, so with that being said, there is a passage in the Old Testament, and again, we're going to unpack it this week and next week, because I think it's appropriate for the season that we're in and the climate that we're in, and really, what is the responsibility of believers in this culture? What is it? 
So if you have your Bibles, uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. It's a famous verse. If you're on social media, everyone's putting it out there. Half of them don't have any idea what it means, but it all sounds to be good. Sounds good. So let's take a look at what it actually means in our individual life, right? For you and for me individually, what, what does it actually mean in our life. Because if we're going to have a healing and a restoration in the land, whether it's personally, whether it's physically, whether it's in, in our government system, then it has to start with you and I, all right? So let's begin to take a look at what the scripture says. So this is a promise that was given to King Solomon about 3,000 you know, years ago, and it's a promise about changing a society or changing a culture. And so here's what it says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek, the fa- uh, and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, <clears throat> uh, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. All right? So let's begin to kind of unpack that because it's not a promise for everyone. It's a promise for a select few. It's a promise to a remnant of people that are called to be salt and light in a corrupt society, in a corrupt world. And corruption happened in Genesis chapter 3, for those of you who are wondering, right? And it started there. And so the calling in the verse is, if my people, right? So who are his people? Well, if you think about what Jesus said, Jesus was talking, and his disciples come, uh, came to him, and he said, they said, hey, your mom and your brothers want to talk to you. And Jesus always has this unique way of flipping everything back on its, uh, on its head to kind of give a, a lesson of teaching. And he says to them, who is my brother and my mother? I mean, it's like, if you don't know who your brother and mother is, we got trouble, right? But he had a bigger principle to teach. And so it's not in your outline, but it'll be here on the, on the screen. Matthew chapter 12, verse uh, 49 and 50. Um, uh, pointing to his disciples, he said, here is my mother and my brother. Verse 50. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven. All right. So who is your fa- Who is your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, right? Whoever does the will of my uh, father in heaven is my brother, is my sister, is my mother, right? So, so the promise that we find is for believers. It, it is for believers. It's not for anyone else to do. This is for us to do if we're going to change a culture, if we're going to change a school board, if we're going to change our family dynamic, if we're going to change whatever needs to have in healing and restoration, it falls on us. So then the next part of that is, he says, uh, going back to uh, Second Chronicles, it says, if my people who are called by my name, right? And, and so the idea of being called by his name, <clears throat> it, it, is, it is a person who is passionate about being a follower of Christ. Not, not, someone, not someone that in the conversation of something, you kind of go, oh yeah, I'm a believer, and, you know, and they think, and you know, it's like, I didn't know that. Because there's no fruit in their life. There's no passion in their life for spiritual things. And he says, so if my people who are believers, who are called by, name, by my name, who have a passion about Jesus, about being a follower of his, is is going to make the difference. Now, now what we've bought into is we've bought into a satanic lie. (gasps) Yikes. Here it is. The satanic lie that we bought into is this. The people do not want to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And that is not true. Jesus is the hope of the world... Jesus is the key to freedom and victory. And if it, it, they, Satan has so convinced us that, that they don't want to hear it, we don't say anything for fear of whatever. Okay? We are not responsible for how they respond to the gospel. We are, yes, you can clap for that, and that's not a golf clap, right? And, We are not responsible for how they respond, but we are responsible for being the salt and light in this work, okay? So let's think about salt and light for a moment. Have you ever gargled with salt water? 
Okay. Boy, is that yummy. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm, I crave it. It's like, no, no, do two teaspoons of salt in there. Mmm, that's yummy. Right? It's nasty. You know, and I don't know, you had a sore throat or whatever it was. I don't even remember. I think we did it when we had strep throat back when I was a kid or whatever. I mean, you couldn't get it out of your mouth fast enough. You would go, oh, and it was either spit down or you know what I'm talking about, right? So we are called to be salt. Salt is good when it's a little bit of season on something, right? When we are over the top, just think of that cup of salt water that you gargled as a kid, right? When we are offensive, that is not what we're called to be. We're called to bring season to a corrupt world. We're called to bring light, not a halogen light, right? N not, not a stadium light. We are called to bring a light to a dark world, right? That, that has both grace and truth in it. That we're not willing to buy into the lies that, that are being told, but at the same time that we have the grace to say, hey, I disagree with you, but God still loves you. Right? So that's where we have to begin to start down this path if we're going to see healing and restoration, whether it be in our families or whether it be in our government or whether it be you know, in, in our school boards or whatever the case or whatever you're thinking about. Right, and, and oftentimes when I get into the, the kind of the political part of it, <clears throat> and, and they're like, "No, no, we need to," you know, and it's it's a sort of hypercharged stuff like this. I, I simply say this: close your eyes and imagine. Okay, so here we're going to close our eyes. Everyone, Simon says, close your eyes. Imagine the politician that you despise the most. Don't say their name, or we'll have a fist fight in the parking lot. <laughs> All right. Now imagine. If that person's heart was transformed by the power of God. See, that is what this verse is talking about. Right? That the hearts of those people who you may despise would be transformed. Think of your heart when it was transformed. Think of what you were up to before you were saved. I don't want to think about what I was up to be saved, what, before I was saved because I wasn't the person that I am now, but God saved me and changed me, right? And so if you ever wonder, like, is really a spiritual revival what's necessary? It's like, <laughs> it's the only thing that's going to fix it. It's the only thing that's going to fix it. Because if you have, and I'm, I'm going too long, if you have corruption on this side or you have corruption on this side, guess what you have? Thank you. If you have rot on this side or rot on that side, what do you have? Wow. Moving on. You get the point. So there are four conditions. The first service didn't get any of that. That's all free of charge, right? Because <laughs> I have a time restraint on the, on the first service. This service I can go till I think I go till around 4.30 or 5, something like that. So, so 2, two o'clock, yeah, 2 o'clock. Actually, I have a lunch appointment. I got to leave sooner than that. So I'll be, I like Somebody will just come up and pray, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be out of here. <clears throat> so, so any time in Scripture where there's a promise, there's always a premise, all right? So, so there's a condition. Like, for instance, the, the promise is God will take care of us. The condition is that we seek him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things will be added to you. Not before, but then, right? So you have your part, you have God's part. And here you have the same thing. You have a, you have a your part and you have a God's part in, in this promise that we find in Scripture. So he says here, he says, if my people who are called by my name, and then there's the four conditions, will humble themselves, will pray, will seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from, the, from heaven, I will forgive their sins, and I will heal their land. Right? And so let's look at the four conditions. Now, we're only going to look at two because of, of time, and next week we'll pick up the next two. But for time today, we're going to look at two. So the first one that he lays out <clears throat> is that we will humble ourselves. So number one in your outline is humble. And it says in here, <clears throat> in, in, my, in the outline, it says, humble is to admit that I'm not in control. Okay? <clears throat> now, I know what everyone's thinking. Everyone's thinking, Pastor Dan, I agree with you, but man, is that hard. So what we're going to do, because you guys look like a great, wonderful group of people, we're going to actually say something together, 
All right? I'm going to say it the first time, and then you're going to say it with me. Are you all ready? All right. So, so what I'm going to say is, God is God. I'm not God. All right? And those of you who are online, you got to join, so you got to participate. Otherwise, we're going to come to your house and mar- march around your house or something like that. All right? So here it is. Ready? We're going to start. Ready? Here it is. God is God, and I'm not God. Okay? Do you believe that yet? Yeah? Now, we believe it theologically, but practically, we don't believe it, do we? Right? In in fact, we get in our way way more often than we need to. Would you agree with that? And here's what's interesting about humility, is nowhere in Scripture are we called to pray for humility. In fact, here's my suggestion to you. Don't ever pray that prayer. Right? Because God will humbleize you, won't he? <laughs> if, there's, if that's a word. I, I, I remember way back when, uh, I think I was in the ministry just a couple years, maybe like three years, and a, a smaller church, a sister church had asked me to go, and I was a youth pastor then, and their pastor was on vacation, and they didn't have an associate and all that stuff. So they called, they asked me, hey, you want to come over on Sunday and preach for me? And I asked the guy that was serving, and he's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. So I'm okay. So now remember, my youth group was bigger than their whole church, Okay. So I am full of my self, right? Now, I know that none of you can believe that I could be arrogant and cocky. I mean, that, that's like, that's the last thing from your mind. You're like, there is no way, right? He must, God really must have changed him in the years since then. And I walked in there and I had a, I, I did have a, actually a decent message. And I started preaching and about a third of the way in, I'm not kidding you, my mind was raptured by Jesus Christ himself. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you what the topic was, what time it was. I could not, I mean, I was total deer in the headlights like, oh no. Now I wasn't you know, I didn't have a lot of experience speaking in front of people, so I didn't know how to kind of like wing it and kind of get back on track. And I'm like, uh, but up, but up, but up, but up, but up. Folks, I'm going to have to start all over, right? And so I had to start all over and I ended up delivering. Now, here's God's sense of humor. It was like Monday or Tuesday, I went to, I think it was like Walmart or one of the big stores. And they had kind of like a leader in their church when the pastor wasn't there that was kind of in charge of everything. And so guess who I ran into? Right? I mean, there's 200,000 people in East County, and I have to run in that guy as we walk down all the aisles in this store, right? It was him coming right at me, and, he, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> no, no, Jesus, take me home, right? And he's like, hey, Dan, how you doing? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I'm totally lost. Can you help me out? Where's my notes at, right? So that is what, so God says, don't ever pray that prayer. But, here, but here's what he wants us to do. Humility is a choice that we make, right? Humility is a choice that we make in life. So what does humility look like, right? Because that's a hard thing to put your finger on. So humility looks like this, and let me just throw on a couple of them. Humility is when you are uh, convicted of your sin. In other words, you sin and the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. Humility is confessing immediately, right? Humility is forgiving someone who's wronged you. Humility is not retaliating when somebody has treated you unfair. In fact, when they slander you, you say nothing, just like Jesus. Humility is serving other people. Humility is respecting authority, even the ones you don't agree with. Humility is picking up trash in a park and making the park cleaner than when you entered. And clean up after your dogs if you're walking in front of my neighborhood, would you? (laughs) Humility is admitting weaknesses, right? In fact, I'm going to admit a weakness to you. If our church ever has a spelling bee contest, don't pick me on your team. (laughs) Humility is speaking well of others even when they put you down. Humility is praying for your enemies, right? Humility looks like this, that you walk into a room of people, instead of worrying about what you look like, asking God to lay a person or bring a person to your life that you can encourage or give them a word of encouragement, right? Humility is you're so wrapped up in what God's doing that you're not paying attention really to your own self, 
right? In fact, I, I wrote this down. It's in your outline. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. I'm a loser. I'm no good. You know, blah, blah, blah. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less, right? That, that's what humility looks like. So, so if we're going to begin a healing and restoration, now remember, whether, whether that's you know, the United States, the state, the county, your house, you personally, then, then we need to begin to recognize that humility is, hey, God, I'm not in control, right? So let's begin to look at when we are human, uh, 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 humble, what, what does God do? So if I'm humble, what does God do? There's a couple things that God does, four things I'll give you. Letter A in your outline is that God will guide you, right? God will guide me, guide you in our life, right? Oftentimes in our life when we are stuck, now remember, we're talking about healing and restoration, right? So oftentimes in our life when we are stuck, we're, when we are in a rut, when we're in a place where we don't know what to do, <clears throat> oftentimes it's because you're relying on your own wisdom and your own knowledge to figure things out. Right? And humility is recognizing, God, I'm not in control. Right? You are God, I'm not in control. And so the promise we find in, in Psalms is says, He guides the who? The humble, right? In what is right. In other words, there's a pathway forward. And humility is going to lead you in that, in that way and teach you uh, them in his way. Second thing is this, because God blesses me. So not only will God guide me, but God will bless me. In Isaiah 66, verse 2, it says, I will bless those who have a humble, humble and, and contrite heart. Right? So if you're, interested in hum if you're interested in God's blessing, it starts with a humble heart. In other words, that you're not thinking of yourself less. I'm a loser. You're just not thinking of yourself very often. You're thinking about more of what God is doing and, and what God is up to. Letter C is a big one. And that is that God will give me the power to change, all right? God will give me the power to change. Now, when we think about healing and we think about restoration in life, sometimes the hurt and pain comes from other people. Other people offend us. Other people hurt us. Other people violate us. Other people do different things, right? But many times, it's us who's done it, who, 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 who do it to, the, to yourself. Right? It's choices, it's habits, it's hang-ups in our life that we continue to do, that we continue to kind of offend ourselves or affect ourselves. So how do you change that? Right? The only way to overcome it is by the Spirit of God transforming your life and freeing you, whether it be forgive you, change your, your personality, habits, and so forth, that you're not continuing to do that. And the only way that that takes place, and we have the one word in grace, you can jot this down on the side, uh, or in the Bible, and that is the word grace, right? If you want to know how do we change, it's grace in our life. Grace is what empowers us to make the changes. Grace is what changed you from where you are now, you know, from 10 years ago or whatever the case may be. So look what James says. James 6 uh, or 4 verse 6 says this. God opposes the proud, but what's he do? He gives grace to the humble, right? He gives you the ability to change. Letter D in your outline. The fourth thing is this, that God will reduce my stress, right? God will reduce my stress, <clears throat> stress in your life. How many have dummy lights in your car? How many of you fill up gas when the dummy lights come on? You change your oil when the dummy lights come on? You check your air presser when the dummy lights come on, right? There, there are people who do that. I know none of you guys. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah, right? <clears throat> so, so we have dummy lights that come on in our car, you know, all, all kinds of appliances and everything else that tells you, hey, you got a problem. Stress in your life. Okay? Stress in your life is a dummy light that's coming on. And you know what it's telling you? You are thinking you are in control. And you forgot God is in control. Right? So when we have stress in our life, it's just a red flag, a yellow flag, an orange flag, a siren. I mean, whatever it is in your life that, hey, you're not in control. You think you are. 
but you're not in control. And so when we start feeling uh, stress in our life, it's a reminder. Just as a dummy light comes on saying, hey, dummy, you're down two quarts of oil, right? You, You need to step back and you need to make sure that you're doing the right thing. So here's what Jesus says. Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. <clears throat> Jesus says, take my yoke, I give you. Everybody know what a yoke is? Yes. Yeah, it's the little yellow thing and the egg. So Jesus hands them an egg and says, break it open, and they break it open. He says, okay, now let the white stuff kind of, or the clear stuff kind of go away. Hold the yellow thing. Now take my yoke. I'm easy. I'm gentle, humble of heart. And they grab the yoke and they begin to walk away. No? Oh, no. So a yoke is a wooden harness, right? And what's interesting about that, and I've done a message way back when, it's kind of fascinating to study. A a blacksmith or a person who would be uh, a a maker of a yoke would actually custom make the yoke for that specific animal. So you didn't have a yoke for all your animals. You had a yoke for each individual animal because just as humans, we have different sizes, shapes, sizes, you know, heights, and all this other stuff. And a yoke was created to be able to pull without having pain, all right? But it's also a symbol in the New Testament of submission, right? That that Jesus is going to give you the yoke that he has custom made for you, right? So, So there isn't the pain and the heartache and the stress. And when you yoked up two oxen or two whatever mules or horses or whatever, they pulled, right? And it it lessened their load right? And so when Jesus says, hey, take my yoke that I've given you, I've custom made a yoke for you, right? It, it's, it's that you partner, right? Or you're, you're submitting to me and that as you pull, you're not experiencing all the load yourself, right? And, and so Jesus says, hey, take it. And then look at the promise that he gives us. He says, learn from me for I am gentle and humble and I will restore deep rest in your soul, right? In, in which case, probably most of us need a double dose of that, please, right? So the first step, the first condition for people who are his people called by his name is humility. So we'll pause and just kind of take a survey. How are you doing on humility? How are you, because remember, this is, this is, this is a, a calling into our lives individually. How are you doing on in the area of humility. Are you living so much focused on what God is doing or are you always worried about how you and you look and you know all that kind of stuff? Right? So, how are we doing on humility? Step 2. The next condition is to pray. All right? To pray in the, in the simple form of what is the definition of prayer? Prayer is simply this. Prayer is I can't, God can. Right? In fact, we've all probably have said it at one time or heard someone say it. Somebody will say, man, I've done everything and all I can do now is pray. They finally got to a point where they realize, I can't, God can. So the sooner you learn that in life, the better off you'll be. Right? So the sooner you learn it, that hey, I can't, God can. And so when we're praying, what are we doing in your outline? We're asking God for help. Right? We're asking God uh, for help. And so he says in, in verse 14, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and they will, and they will pray, all right? They, they will pray and ultimately God, God will hear, 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 hear us and heal us. So how do we pray? I mean, that's confusing. I mean, where do we start? How does that work? Well, fortunately, the scripture kind of gives us a little bit of an outline of what to look at. Right? And so in your outline, you have John chapter 16, verse 23. And it gives us some outlines about kind of how we pray or what we need to pray about. So John 16, 23 says this. In that day, Jesus said to his disciples, you'll no longer ask me for anything. I tell you the, uh, I tell you the truth. My Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Verse 24. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. All right? So, so, so what do we need to do? Letter A in your outline is that Jesus wants us to ask him. Right? He, he wants us to ask him. <clears throat> now, it says that we can ask for anything. Right? In other words, there's nothing that's off the table. Right? We can ask for anything. 
Doesn't mean that he's going to give it to us, and we'll get into that in a second, but that there's nothing that we go, oh, you can't pray about that, right? So we are to ask him. So then the question is, theologically, people wrestle with this, if God knows my every need, and he knows before I even ask him, why do I need to ask him? You ever wrestle with that? Yeah, the more you know about the Bible, the more you kind of run these things through your head, right? For instance, it says in Scripture that Jesus never sinned. Okay, so here it is. He couldn't sin. He did not have the seed of man in him. That's the virgin birth. So it was impossible for Jesus to sin. That's a trippy thought, isn't it? All right? So what else do I have? Let's see. So, so... uh, yeah, that's like a whole semester of debating Christology in school, right? It's like, whoa, that's kind of crazy. So, so Jesus wants us to ask, why? Because when we ask, we learn to trust him. Okay, so think of this this way. When you bring home the little precious baby from the hospital, right? Everyone go, ah. Yeah, exactly. You feel for them too. So they bring them home, and that little wonderful baby girl, baby boy, does something when there's a need. They cry, right? And cry and cry and cry. And so mom or dad or whoever's watching the kid, they run in and they try to figure out, is it a bottle? Is it a diaper? Is it, you know, whatever it is, right? And over time, as a parent, you're actually teaching that child to trust you. Right? And you want to build that trust in you. As I shared in the first service, w- when Russia was a communist country and they had a, a big orphanages, they didn't have people taking care of the babies. They put the babies in a crib and they just left them there. There was a lot of psychological problems for those kids because they never had that experience where they cried and someone came. And so there was a trust issue right, in life. So psychologically, there, there, there were a lot of problems with some of the folks who were, who were raised in that kind of thing. I don't know, we may have had that in America too, but I remember that in, in Russia in, in when it was the USSR. And so God wants us to ask because he wants us to learn to trust him. Be- because if he knew your need before you asked and poof, there it was, you just kind of go, oh, that's cool, right? There, there wouldn't be that trust that, that begins to take place. And so we need to build that trust. Letter B in your outline is we ask in Jesus' name, all right? So I ask in my name is what he says in, in the verse 24. It goes on and it says, until now you have not asked for anything. Ask in my name and you will receive it, okay? Now, now here's kind of the fun part, right? Because <clears throat> you'll hear people think that it's a formula, and that if you just say the formula correctly, it's like, poof, it's the lottery ticket, you're going to win, right? And, and so you'll hear the, you know, the different ones on TV, and it's like, and I pray in Jesus' name, ugh. And everyone goes, whoa, I mean, that right there just moved God, right? I mean, he, he has to, I mean, I don't know what the guy answered for, but there was the Jesus, uh, uh, and I mean, that's it, he has to answer it. And I mean, you pray like, in Jesus' name, it's like, please, Next right? So somehow we've come up with this idea that if you say it in the right tone or the right cadence, that, that all of a sudden God's like, I, I got to move. I don't know. What do they ask for? Okay, I've just got to do it. Folks, that, that isn't it. It is way deeper than that, all right? It, it's not just kind of some cool way that you hear somebody put an emphasis on the uh part, and I don't know why the guys have to use the uh part all the time. It's a little confusing to me, but anyway, I'm not that style of guy, <clears throat> When we pray in Jesus' name, we are actually surrendering to his will and asking that his will be done. Remember the Lord's Prayer? Your kingdom come, your will be done. Right? So when we're praying in Jesus' name, we're literally humbling ourselves. And we're saying, Jesus, we trust you so much that regardless of what the answer may be, we are completely, perfectly fine with whatever it is that you want to do, right? And so when we pray in Jesus' name, it's not like this cool tagline that all of a sudden God has like his arm bar and he has to do something, right? It's that we're aligning our heart with the will of God in our prayer, okay? Now, we can pray about anything, 
right? You can pray about anything, but when we, when we add in the in Jesus' name part, we're, we're literally saying, hey, I'm surrendering. I'm completely giving it completely to you. And so if you could imagine, prayer is, I can't, God can. And as we pray and as we worship him and we get to the end and it's like in Jesus' name, we're in alignment with him. We're surrendered completely to him, right? Now, now the, the pushback is, is, well, I prayed and I don't get everything that I want. And I, and I just kind of want you with this here. Nowhere does it say that you'll get everything that you want. It says pray about anything, Right? And again, the humility part is that we're going to be willing to trust God in the midst of all that takes place. All right? So how's your prayer life going? Okay, you got the hu- uh, humility part down, you're getting the prayer part down. James chapter 5, verse uh, 13, it says this, and uh, <clears throat> is anyone in trouble? He should pray, right? Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. I don't hear anybody singing, so no one must be happy today. Verse 14, is anyone sick? He should call on the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord, uh, uh, the Lord will rise up him, will raise him up, and if he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Okay, so, so let me just kind of cover a couple things real quick on that. <clears throat> one, one is, which is letter C in your outline, is that we need to get other people to pray for us. Right? We need to get other people to pray for. Whether it's in our community group, our brothers and sisters that we know in the church, outside the church, whatever it is, that we need to get people to pray. Now, in here it says that we're to call on the elders. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's certainly, you know, certainly we're, we're willing and, and, and capable of, of doing that. But in the New Testament time, we believe in the priesthood of the believer. Old Testament times, only the priest could do certain things. New Testament times, you have the same Holy Spirit that I have right? You, you have the same teacher that I have. You have the same access to God as I have. I don't have a special bat line to God that you don't. None of, none of that stuff. So, so we have the same. So your prayers are just as effective as my prayers are, right? Or the elders' prayers. Now, there's nothing wrong with getting the elders to come and pray for you, but it's not a have-to thing, all right? And then the second part in there that a lot of times people will ask is the anointing with oil, and, and they'll say, well, you know, it, should we anoint with oil or should we not anoint with oil? And I remember back in school, and this is true, this is true, that they, they were talking about what kind of oil do you use? Do you use canola oil? Do you use vegetable oil? What kind do you use? And I'm like, I use motor oil. I use like 1030. <laughs> you know, in the summertime, in the wintertime, I use a little heavier grade for my car. You know, that kind of stuff. And, and so th- there's, there's nothing magical about the oil. Okay, the oil in the New Testament is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, all right? So, so it's simply saying that as you anoint them, and if you anoint them, there, you're fine, and you're c- perfectly capable of doing that, and so are the elders of doing that. So the oil isn't the magical formula. The oil is just simply saying, hey, we're coming and we're believing in faith that the presence of God is here, the Holy Spirit is present in that person's life. All right, so the anointing part isn't like a magical formula, but go back to verse 15, and Sarah, if you don't mind going back, verse 15, it says this, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick well, right? Not the elders and not the oil. The prayer uh, offered in faith will make a, a person well. Right? And so we want to make sure that we recognize that. So whether you get the pastors to pray for you, whether you get a group of people to pray for you, whatever the case is, you want a group of people to pray with you. You got that? All right, D. I'm running out of time here. D is you believe and expect an answer, right? If you're going to pray, you might as well believe that God's going to do something, right? And, and so it's important that we, we get to that point where we, hey, we believe and we expect. Ephesians 6, 18, it says, pray in the spirit at all times with all kinds of prayers. A- uh, ask for everything you need. So there it is again. I mean, it's, you know, there's nothing off the table. Um, to do this, you must always be ready and never give up. Always pray for all God's people. So we got all kinds of alls and we got all kinds of always in there. And, and so we need to make sure that we're recognizing that if we're going to pray, I can't, God can and that prayer isn't secondary, but it's primary, 
right? In fact, the, the, the amazing mystical thing about prayer is you can have a conversation with a person until you're blue in the face, until the old term, the cows come home and all that other stuff, and it doesn't change them one bit. You hit your knees and the Spirit of God begins to work in their heart and change begins to happen, right? Yes, yeah, someone ought to clap for that. And then letter E in your outline is you keep on praying until God tells you to stop, right? So there are three answers that God gives us. Yes, no, and wait. And until you get the no, you keep on praying. You keep on believing. You keep on trusting. It may be a week. It may be a month. It may be 10 years. It may be 20 years. It may be 50 years. Right? People say, well, you know, I have a brother, I have a child, and they, they walked away from the Lord, or they're not with the Lord, and, you know, and I, I'm just not, and they're hard-hearted and all this other stuff. Don't give up until their last breath. Right? You don't give up. You keep on praying. You keep on believing. You keep on trusting. Now, if God gives you the no, it's done. There's no more negotiating. Right? It's kind of like a parent, right? When the, it's like when I say nope, it's done. Right? It's not like, yeah, but what? Uh, uh. No, it's no. All right? And so we just need to make sure that we're passionate about that and that we're going to pray until the Lord says no. So let's pause. Because remember, at the end of this, this isn't about a country thing. This isn't about a state thing. It's not a county thing. It's an individual thing. We are, as believers, and I'm assuming you guys are believers and those who are watching are believers, we are a remnant. God has always worked to change the world with a remnant of people. Never the majority, always the minority. And he changes the world when groups of people, literally handfuls of people, like 12, isn't that in the Bible? Changes the world. Changes a culture, think of this, of Rome, where they would be crucified for Jesus to a place where there's crosses all over signifying that Jesus is alive and that he was crucified and resurrected. Read Acts, right? It's only a remnant of people that can make a change. And oftentimes as believers, we feel so overwhelmed, right? And I'm going to be candid with you. I'm very concerned about our freedom of speech. I'm very concerned about our freedom of religion. We may like that somebody is being shut down, right, if you don't like them. But let me just warn you, the message that we have is offensive, and we will be shut down. But with all that being said, with all that being said, we have a power behind us that's mightier than an army, Amen. right? It's true. And go home and read today in Acts. They're told, the, the disciples are told, if you talk about Jesus one more time, you're going to be arrested. And some of them were arrested, right? And you know, when they got out of jail, do you know what the first thing, it was the very first church prayer meeting. You can go home and read it. The very first thing they prayed for, guess what they prayed for? Safety, security, and a good place to hide out. No, they, play, they prayed for boldness to proclaim the very message that the government says, if you talk, you're going to be crucified. So change happens with a small amount of people. We could be, right, and I'm not saying this in a braggadocious way, but we could be the change agents to change a whole culture Right? In fact, if you want to be honest, we could take one section, and that could be a change agent for a whole culture. How crazy is that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, thank you that as we sit here today and just in your presence with the Spirit of God working in our hearts, we recognize that there is nothing impossible and that you're an incredible, faithful God. And Lord, we hold up our nation to you, we hold up our families to you, our schools, our businesses, just the church, us individually, we just hold us, our, ourselves up to you. 
and pray, God, that your spirit would work in a a miraculous and amazing way. Father, that the change will begin to happen in my life and in the lives of the folks who are here today and watching online. And Lord, we just believe that, that, that the impossible is possible with you. And Lord, as we begin to move forward, just give us the wisdom and discernment on how we are to respond in a humble way, in our, in our prayer, in a way of prayer and fasting, Lord, that you would give us that direction and guidance. And with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, at the very beginning I talked about my people, and maybe you're here, you're watching, and you've never given your life to Christ, and I want to give you that opportunity to invite Jesus into your life to be your Lord and Savior. And we just do a little ABC. It's not a formula. It's just a way we track it. A is admit that we're sinners, that we're all sinners, that we've all missed the mark. B is believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that he died on a cross and that he rose again. And C is to confess him to be your Lord and Savior. And so if you're here or you're watching online, you've never given your heart to Christ, just pray this prayer with me silently. Just say, Lord Jesus, today, I admit that I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of God, that you died on a cross and that you rose again. And today, I confess him. I confess Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for changing me. Thank you for making me a brand new creation in Christ. It's in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer with me today and you're here, you can grab a green bag on the way out. If you prayed with that online, you can text the number on the screen there and we'll be happy to get with you and help you to grow in your faith. So thank you for those of you who are watching online. Thank you for watching. We look forward to seeing you next week. We'll finish part two up. So God bless you. Well, I hope you've been encouraged by that message today and that you'll be making time each day to connect with God in prayer. Thank you for worshiping with us, and I invite you to connect with others this week. Connection is very important. One way you can connect is by joining a group. Many of our groups have just completed their first week of the 40 days of prayer, and it's not too late to join in. To learn more, text the word group to the number on your screens or check out the website link. And then join us next week, either online or in person, at one of our live experiences. They happen at 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock every Sunday morning at our Oakley campus. We would love to see you there. If you have any questions about how to connect, simply text the word connect to the number on your screen, or you can go to our website at laurelridgechurch.org. I hope you have an amazing week, and don't forget to invite your friends to join us next Sunday.